This program was brought to you by Kola Institute of Venture at Tel Aviv University. It's a particular pleasure to, uh, be the, to lead this, uh, this uh, final session. Uh, this particular, if I start with a uh, personal statement, uh, this particular event is quite, uh, quite significant for me because it puts together two of my, of my passions. One is my engagement with BGI, uh, that has been intensified over the last few years uh, and coming often here to Lisbon. And the other one is with uh, Tel Aviv University, uh, setting up the, recently the Kohler Institute of Venture. So that's fantastic to have them both together. And in terms of uh, uh, personalities, uh, it's all started here with uh, my business partner, Joao, who is here, who put us all together. Uh, and oddly enough, the, my romance, because I am located at London Business School, uh, so my romance with Tel Aviv University started meeting uh, President Plaster three years ago, almost to the date, here in Lisbon. Small world. So it's a kind of a cycle that is uh, culminating today and I'm very much uh, excited about it past and going forward. Now, before coming here, I asked uh, some of my colleagues in London, in the community, and more in private equity, what do you think about, about water? I so, said, no, we are not interested. This is a niche. We heard a little bit from Reid at the beginning about it. Oh, you know, there are not too many, even VCs, who, who deal with that. It's a niche. Well, a niche. What percentage of uh, the globe is what is oceans? 80%, 70 74%, okay? So it's an issue. Um, I was trying to pick up some themes that uh, popped up during the uh, discussion today. I will just list them, you know? So starting with the ocean, uh, the marine organism, the biofilms, the, uh, the energy issues, including the desalination, all spills, uh, accidents, and monitoring of that monitoring technology all the area of agro-food, which the importance of that uh, is, is, is phenomenal. Again, picking up some of the numbers, because the globe is reaching population going up from 5.7 uh, billion now to 9.6, and uh, you know, even now we are bursting at the seams. So these are huge, huge uh, 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 pressures that are coming and needs that, uh, where would that come from? So again, picking up on this, this is just on the ocean side. We talked about geotechnical uh, technologies and uh, new engineering materials, uh, fishery, we can go on and on. In fact, there is a whole list of issues related to ocean that have not been discussed here because they are not as deep end or, or deep technology perhaps, including uh, logistic infrastructure, sports, uh, tourism, sport activities. And somebody mentioned quickly about real estate expand, expansion. All of these are ocean related. This is one half. Then there is the inland water aspects of uh, pollution, as was mentioned, uh, the quality of the water, as well as the scarcity of that. And uh, again, whether this is uh, wastewater treatment, uh, reclamation, and uh, again, terminology which I picked up. Um, take this, and again, if you look at the way I see that is the tensions. The tensions are not necessarily, it's not, and the collaboration is not Portugal and Israel. That's easy, relatively speaking. It's not even the ocean and the inland. It is really the basic science that we hear today, including with commercialization aspects, taking that to the other extreme way to make this a matter of uh, successful to finally input uh, the real life of people. Um, as some of the, and again, the list of challenges was mentioned by Roy at the beginning. I will just quickly mention some of the facts about being capital intensive, being something which is actually striking to be so obvious and not obvious, which is that this is a, everybody expects you to get it. You cannot really charge too much because people expect to get uh, 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 water and to be treated for that. So uh, long being long process, very similar to life cycles, the regulatory environment, which I will come with a comment in a minute, 
Uh, I would add one thing, which is, was very clear from a lot of the discussion, uh, is the multidisciplinary nature. You know, listening to Hadassia, you know, it's, it's, it's they both the microbiology on one hand and the engineering on the other hand. They got, you really got to build teams that can address all of this together. Uh, you mentioned the legal responsibilities and the regulatory environment being challenging. Uh, by the way, which was another comp something which I picked up, which was that totally striking, is the fact that in hospital, all this uh, uh, water sewage, you know, is not being treated. I couldn't believe it. You know, all of these chemicals from chemothe chemotherapy and drugs, we heard 80% go through the system, so the sewage just, just goes straight into wherever. So that's, um, you know, for me, a novice in this area who, who totally, you know, didn't know much except for getting this button here, um, it was quite striking. So I guess what I would like to do is to rely on the panel and really for you in terms of A, what you guys learn from each other and what can we do in terms of making the, bri to bridge the gap, which is, as I said, it's between the phenomenal uh, things done here in science and ultimately, given all the challenges, to make them of, of use to humankind, touching upon the most important aspects, food, sustainability, energy. I mean, these are the matters that are the, you know, where we are primarily being constrained. So perhaps I will start with, uh, actually, uh, with you, uh, you know, that you resolve all these, these challenges. What did you pick up and from your vast experience in the area? think when you, you know, when you talk about um, uh, how do we turn all this scientific uh, research into something viable, I mean, at, at the end of the day, we're looking for something that is technologically feasible and economically viable, and it's about having the constant feedback and discussion between academia <laughs> and uh, not just, you know, in investors like ourselves, but also with the industry and getting the feedback uh, during the R&D stage, uh, which is crucial because oftentimes you may get with a product to the market and then find out that uh, you found a great solution to a problem that doesn't really exist or that nobody cares about uh, or that you need to tweak certain elements of your, um, of your product and then when you get this um, dialogue going on, that's when you can create uh, stuff that will may ab ab able to actually succeed in, in the marketplace, and you may als also already start cultivating your potential customers. And that uh, goes to the, you know, you said uh, that uh, you talked to your colleagues in London, and that uh, they said, well, you know, water, it's, it's a niche. Um, uh, it's once we manage to get uh, success stories from the water industries in terms of uh, IPOs or other uh, big success stories, that's when it's going to start interest more and more investors and you get more money flowing in there and one thing uh, feeds into another. Maybe I'll go around uh, the panel here and then we'll open up again. Well, uh, you listened to the whole day. Yeah, yeah I, I listened to the whole day and I think it was very interesting. Uh, I, I fully agree with your comments. Uh, the first fact is that even if um, the different talks were, were ba are based on different subjects, that you can see that they, they mix together when we talk about, about water. In my case, I'm uh, involved in marine renewable energy, so, but it's the same because you have environmental problems, you have technology of many different kinds from sensors, from, uh, you know that the estimate for the cost of uh, energy in marine, marine renew, renewable energy is that up to 25% of the final cost of energy is maintenance, operation and maintenance. So everything related to predictive maintenance is critical because it is extremely difficult, extremely expensive to go to the sea. So anticipating all that. So that kind of challenges that we can see in, in the piping, uh, in, 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 uh, piping systems, it's also the same in, when you go to the ocean. So uh, materials, uh, biofueling, uh, understanding all the chemicals involved, 
is, is critical. So from, from the point of view of technology, really this is a very uh, interesting challenge because it copes with uh, many different areas of technology and engineering. Uh, but it, it goes beyond that. Uh, and being involved in marine renewable energy, the role of business is very obvious. I mean, because basically you are starting, in a way, a new industry, almost from zero. Uh, and it is a very, as I said, very expensive industry. Uh, as I said, everything done at the sea is at the cost of three or four times what you could do in, uh, on shore. And also the risk is also very much present because you don't go to the sea when you want. You, you go there to do any operation when the sea allows. And that introduces uh, not only an extra cost, but also the risk. And the risk means also higher insurance costs, etc. So when you think about these technologies, these new technologies, um, one of the issues is uh, as I said, the cost and the risk. The other is the time to market, because you cannot start small. I mean, you, you, on solar PV, for instance, you start small, and, and that's, that it fits your house. But it, when you go to, to the sea for offshore wind or wave or whatever, there is, you know, the scale is the scale imposed by the sea. So, and, and this, um, this jump from something in the laboratory to something to the sea is extremely difficult. Uh, and in particular, and it's w one of the plots that was shown today about, uh, it was about wave energy. You could see that between 2006, more or less, until 2008, 9, there was you know, a very steep increase in the number of prototypes being tested in the water. And suddenly, in 2008, it disappears. Of course, it's related to the economic crisis and you know, the unavailability of companies to take risk. So everything is connected. Then you have also all the impacts, all the conflict of uses of the sea. Whenever you want to start a new business in the sea, you have to manage with fisheries, uh, maritime transport, etc., etc. So it's really. You know, and that's, to me, what was interesting today is to see that, indeed, we are talking about different disciplines, but they are all always connected, and uh, we can do anything without without uh, this very wide range of uh, of of, uh, of teams. Zeb, you want to have some general <coughs> observation? Yeah, I mean. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at a reservation from, from an entrepreneurship point of view and uh, one of the things you see that there's a lot, of, um, a lot of technology comes around us and the biggest issue is how to actually convert it to business. And um, even though that uh, you may say that, as you said, 80% of the world is water and water equals energy, it's not something you can go to the supermarket with it. So, yeah. So, and there is a big gap between the understanding of the, let's say, economical world that water equals energy, energy equals money, uh, than the behavior of the business world that water is something we should get from God. So, uh, and, and this gap is actually hurting the business environment because this is the gap where instead of selling something to uh, that's an environment that wants to pay for the product. You try. You need to sell the product. You need to sell the services to environment that is actually buying it because it's actually being forced to buy it. And this is the big difference between the water industry and the telecom industry. In the telecom industry, you buy the product because you want to make a phone call. You want to download SMSs or whatever you want to do with your machine. In the water industry, you buy the service, the product, because somebody told you that you need to buy it because of a some sort of regulatory uh, issues, not because you wanted to buy it. And therefore, we need to sell into organ to the government organizations, and we need to sell into uh, organizations where cost is the biggest issue, because the only thing they're doing is maintenance. And in maintenance, the only thing that bothers you is, is the cost. 
you want to do to reduce them. And it's always something that nobody wants to pay for because, okay, I mean, I put already the, the, the water pipe network 25 years ago, so why should I, I invest more money into it? In, into why I need to invest money in, into reclamation, etc. So, and one of the things that uh, I don't know if this conference or any other conference should actually twist away is to, to make the whole water industry based on a need, not on a force. Again, this is my ignorance about the sector, uh, is the fact that we were discussing here three main parties, but one other party is kind of missing. The three main parties we discussed is universities, no doubt, basic research, government through grants or EU grants were the background of that. The third one are the startups, the young companies we, that we see here and they were presented. What about the large corporations? And that comes to the, the, the point of visibility and, visibility and, uh, and also uh, success. How many listed companies you have in exchanges that are more or less in the space of water and ocean? You talk about this, the big, is that such a nascent industry that there are not so many? In the pharma, you have so many. It's also a very long process, right? Obviously, drug discovery is a long process, but there are many, many major pharma companies and people can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. They don't see it in the case of what I'm not familiar with. So, um, so I, th I think we need to you know, d d defi define uh, the issue. So first of all, you have uh, listed water utilities, uh, particularly in, in the US where the market is mainly privatized which is not the case uh, many times in, in Europe, but it is the case, for example, in the UK. So part of it is driven by the market structure. Um, and so that goes, but that's again, you know, sort of water utilities. Then you have large corporates uh, where you may not be, uh, f uh, their name will not immediately strike you as one dealing with water, but it's, uh, it may be a significant part of what they do, or at least a part of what they do. Uh, GE has, there is GE water. Uh, so it's part of what uh, GE does is also in the water industry. Uh, Siemens actually divested their, their, uh, the, their water. What percentage of Hutchinson is water? Uh, water is still uh, a rather small because also the youngest uh, division within Hutchison. Um, and, and Hutchison is uh, an over $50 billion company annually. But the fact that Hutchison went into the water business uh, is because they, they think it's not only important, but also because there is uh, money to be, to be made uh, there. Uh, and then you see other companies like uh, Asylum, or um, I mentioned a number of uh, uh, an, an IPO in, in that uh, um, sector, also from the desalination uh, energy recovery. I admit that there are not as many as in other industries, However, there are some. Yeah, but all the companies yeah. you mentioned are service companies. True. No, it's None uh, of them <laughs> is technology. And not only that, but even <laughs> this, you were able to mention everything that you know yeah. in, in, in one minute. You know, try to go to other industries, <clears throat> biotech, it will take for ages, and, and so on. So we are, this industry is probably where the pharma was 150 years ago, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. If I can add a couple of points from, from a different perspective, maybe the hat that I wear every day, which is more a commercialization and technology perspective in terms of what can build the market. So when I'm fascinated, I was fascinated by, by the day and the amount of uh, how everything is intertwined. Uh, that's, that's an aspect. But also taking Clayton Christensen's approach where there are some technology advances today, IoT, machine to machine, that will enable uh, and I, I can see that happening maybe in the next 10 or 20 years, will enable uh, this transformation of the sector. And when I say transformation of the sector, is everything that we do, humans, ends up in the oceans. So the oceans, in a way, is like a, a, a dumping of, uh, sector where everything, all the pollution ends up there. So that's, that's something that we will need to take care of from a pollution perspective system, systematic approach. But from a commercialization approach, the interesting thing is that things that we could never envisage 
doing and dealing with problems that they could not deal with, maybe now with the sensors, with the uh, algorithms, with software, we can start tackling. And um, this will transform, in my view, these startups that can emerge and doing tackling small problems eventually will transform absolutely the way utilities look at their systems and the way they, they manage their businesses. Um, even the way CapEx at the moment is a barrier to entry, transforming CapEx, as for example, Ziff was saying, saying this, uh, we transform this CapEx into OPEX. We just uh, charge rent, whatever number of sensors, we put in the money, banks finance, and then we charge rent. We're already doing that in different sectors of uh, IoT, for example, because we need to put equipment in the ground. But we don't charge for equipment, we charge for rent. And um, if the business is sustainable uh, on the long term, if you're providing value, data that they need to support themselves, i.e. the incumbents, the incumbent, then the sector. And I'm fa fascinated by the fact that this is probably one of the last sectors that has been untouched, as you were saying, Ali, now. You know, it's like 150 years ago, the farming industry was at this you know, empirical stage of trying and error. Uh, I think we are at this transformation point where I'd like to hear your views on if you see, if you see this kind of uh, technology enablement platform that will transform this sector as a whole and also the players that are there. First of all, I certainly hope so. Uh, you know, when they asked uh, um, Mao Zedong what he thinks about the uh, French Revolution, he said it's too early to tell. Um, so I think in, in, in some sense it is uh, maybe a bit too, too early to tell and it goes through a certain uh, um, cycle. I mean, even if you look at uh, the internet, right, there was the big bubble of, the, uh, of just uh, 15 years ago. And now you, you, you again, you know, you have the prices rise, but people perceive it differently. There are already companies uh, with a lot of real revenue behind them. And, and so I think, you know, as I said at the end of uh, my talk, uh, that uh, the, the need for water will not disappear. The need to treat water and uh, everything that surrounds this industry. However, it will take time. We need success stories. We need more uh, publicly listed companies. Uh, but uh, I, believe, I believe in the sector, but it, it takes a lot of patience and, uh, um, and, and, and a lot of an understanding of where will be the interesting um, subsectors within the sector, for example, the, the sensors that you mentioned or, or other uh, subsectors that can really show this uh, interesting uh, high, uh, high growth that will appeal to investors. I think if, if I look, at, just to take a little bit more uh, optimistic view on that, similar, similar situation but not as bad in terms of public uh, visibility is the agriculture. Uh, that again, relatively to other sectors, nobody doubts the importance of it on one hand. Probably second to water, food is the most important thing, right? Uh, and, uh, well, there is the ozone, I mean, oxygen, I guess. Uh, so, uh, yet, relatively speaking, the agricultural sector is again very highly underrepresented in our stock market or elsewhere. It's not as, as bad as, as water, but it's certainly lagging behind all others, like telecommunication, for instance. But relatively recent, it comes to life because of scarcity of food and the significant increase in commodity prices, you know, food commodities. Uh, we have seen that happening. So that's all of a sudden we have huge growth. You, you know, somebody mentioned Africa at the beginning of the day, you know, Africa is becoming now more important or some part of it. So perhaps that's seeing what happened in agricultural might now happen also uh, in the area of, uh, of, uh, of water. Um, maybe I'll take it to the audience to, to pick up what did you learn, what did change your mind, or what opportunities you see. Just share with us including the researchers, in terms of what they heard from others, you know? What are observations you can make? Either challenges or opportunities, no? Yes?
a brave storm. Everyone's a brainstorming. Everyone needs water. Okay, yes. let me let me let me ice the the break. Yeah. Uh, I'm Rafaela Matos. Uh, I'm principal researcher at the National Civil Engineering Laboratory and responsible for the Hydraulic and Environment Department. I'm also member of the board of the Portuguese Water Partnership, which is a cluster of 120 stakeholders in the water sector. <coughs> uh, unfortunately, I have been here only in the afternoon, so I could not manage to get here in the morning. But I find very interesting session. Uh, as it was already said, uh, multidisciplinarity, um, combining different sciences, uh, R&D and uh, market, etc. Very interesting things. A lot of um, innovation based on ICT linked with engineering and uh, other sciences. But I, I do believe that um, besides uh, technological innovation, which is now being fascinating, and we have seen uh, this afternoon a lot of uh, new insights on it. Innovation is today much more than technological in innovation. Innovation is also today a challenge for governance, for society, for institutions. So we cannot expect that a society changes completely if we not innovate beside technology beside technology, also in governance and in the institutions, in the, in the, in the groups. So, and something, in, in some way, I do believe that this is very much underestimated by societies in, in general. So, I, I would like to be a little bit provocative on this issue, because I do believe that uh, we can only incorporate the benefits of technology in our society in the future and also the benefits in terms of uh, having a better society, less discrepancies, less poorness, etc., with innovation in the models of governance, of financing innovation, uh, and of uh, changing mind of people. Thank you. I can certainly sympathize from another aspect uh, it has been said, and I heard it many times, that wars start because of lack of water. By the end of the day, except for ego, uh, one driver for wars is, is, uh, is water. And uh, what we've seen, and I know this has nothing to do directly with the topic here, it has to do with global climate changes, uh, but if you look what happens in Africa, the droughts that we have here, which is lack of water, which kills the animals and, and drive people from their homes. This is a, trage a tragedy of colossal magnitude. And if we had the capabilities to find, again, water solution uh, combined with more en you know, energy uh, sustainability as a whole, uh, that will make uh, the world a much a, be a better place to be. So it's really coming all the way to political pressures as well. The issue is that nobody has a little bit like the ozone layers and, and, and global warming. It's not enough motivation uh, to every country on their own to carry the, the torch and to, to provide a solution. That's, that's as I see it. Uh, anyway. Let's take uh, more observation. Now you had more time to think? No? Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Fernando Cruz. I'm a mentor from the entrepreneurship uh, programs. Uh, I think that we, we, we are losing opportunities because if we include this kind of information in our school in the beginning of the, 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 the scholarship, uh, it will be good for, for, for creating uh, an idea of the opportunity, opportunities that uh, water technology have in the, in the professional careers. And the, uh, unfortunately, we don't have that kind of information in our school. That's why uh, the, the, this kind of technology are abandon abandoned. And, uh, and I think that will be a good, a good effort to include this kind of information in, in the uh, early pe people. Uh, we think that it will be good to increment this kind of, of approach in the, 
our, our civilization. This is a, not only a problem here. It is a problem university-wide in general, and I can say about, you know, at engineering schools, which I know in the UK, and uh, uh, to a large extent also observation television university, it's really you need to bring uh, business students much closer, and I think you touched upon something we said before, into, into uh, dealing with the uh, 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 researchers, really, because there you can influence the, the driver to, to direct value and commercialization much faster. And that's a major challenge uh, that, in fact, as I go around Europe, at least, uh, that's a challenge of most universities, how to transform this uh, cliche that you would like to make the university more entrepreneurial a reality. And that's, that's uh, blending the two together is, is, is definitely absolutely right. You're touching something very important. Can I add a comment on that, Ellie? Um, a while ago, we were talking about that. Uh, I, I thought if you touched on the issue, um, managers don't, can't not manage without information. And uh, you know, what data they have is uh, sometimes an excuse even, you know, outdated data. Uh, is an excuse not to do anything, which is great. So sometimes they can keep their expenses down. You know, 20% uh, wastewater is okay, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I do believe that even governance of these companies will be changed by the power of information. So then the question becomes uh, the public also as as a, as a education, of course. But uh, we can only treat the problem if we know that we are suffering from a specific problem. That's the, that's the point I'm, I'm trying to do, or make, uh, in, other, in other words, the fact that IoT now and M2M and all these technologies are becoming ubiquitous um, c could be a very strong driver for even in, in uh, energy. You know, this, the fact that all these uh, um, deployments and solutions can be censored, they can inform weather-wise, et cetera, et cetera, pollution-wise, um, they can give us a lot of data that then governments can use to empower uh, end users to demand, you know, I want my taxes to be paid this, this way or that way. And that we are pollution, uh, polluting uh, or we are not being efficient in the way we are handling X and Y uh, energy, etc. So I, th I do believe that by providing more information to the public, then even the way gov uh, governments will have to act upon information will be a very dr a strong driver, Fernando, for example, for the point that you've, you've touched upon. You know, these things will need to be informed before uh, companies can act on them. They, ne they need to have an excuse to spend X dollars on fixing the problems. Uh, but we're not even there, I, I guess. You know. Maybe I, I'd like to, to add something. <laughs> Uh, I, I think, Rafael, you, you, you raised an interesting point. Um, and what, what makes things change? And I think we have, uh, in the last, I don't know, 20, 15 years, uh, two sectors that change a lot. One was uh, communications. It changed completely uh, beyond what we could expect uh, 20 years ago. And the other is energy. The energy sector is also changing a lot. Uh, not only in terms of the way uh, you know the, the companies are structured, but also how individuals take a, a role on it. Uh, and in both case, cases, I th and I, I don't and I don't see if this can happen in in the water sector. That, that's why I would like to raise this point. In both cases, the changes result from the fact that individuals could take a lead on something. Uh, for instance, in energy, the fact that you can now be uh, self-producers of energy uh, and the fact that you can, not yet today, but within a few years, you can uh, adjust your consumption to the cost of energy will also you know, change completely the way, uh, the passive way that most of us use energy, at least electricity. Uh, in the case of, of water uh, delivery, uh, it's not clear to me whether the, the consumer will have any possibility of interacting, whether he will not be passive, just opening the tap and closing the tap without further. Um, 
So because, of course, if, if for some reason the technology or governance would introduce a, 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 a more, um, a more um, uh, well, in a way, powerful rule for the, for the end user, I think that that would drive uh, innovation and, and how things are, are done. But I suppose that but it but would be difficult to anticipate. Price, maybe if the cost yeah. goes up. If I mean the cost Israel, goes up. As if, if, you, yeah. if you mix with our pockets, then well, sure. maybe, maybe. And transparency, as you said, information. If there is, like today we do have in many cities, <coughs> information about the quality of the, world, uh, of the, of the air Real outside. Yeah. You know, if you do have information about the quality of your water, people will raise hell because they see what they are getting into. If they don't know, they, they, they drink it. If they do know, you know, and about, the same about the sewage, you know, the moment you have this information out and now there is more monitoring uh, devices uh, available, I think this will internalize the, 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 the problem. This is proven to be, I mean, if you, there was a test uh, in the States, it's giving people a monitor of their home appliances consumption. And suddenly their total consumption went down. Now, they didn't change anything in their life <coughs> habits, but just the fact that they see what is the consumption and what levels people reduce the consumption, or at least used the same, the energy for what they need. Same thing about any resources we have. I mean, we today spend waste, in other words, not just in leaks. We just, even in our home consumption of water, we spend about 20% of the water that we actually buy. So it's all about um, moving the whole sensor world into, into the household. And you ask this question is how we can make it better for people. And if people will be able to know actually what they're spending from, they will spend less. And then actually that's a chain reaction. It says if you are, you, we use less then in practice, we don't need to produce less. Uh, Jerusalem this year, they made uh, a big advertising in the city. The population went up, the consumption went down. The total consumption of water went down. Th it was th th thanks purely... You. Thanks, Yusuf. Thanks to you. <laughs> because of the... No, no, that stands to us about uh, a quarter of percent, but the percentage were higher. So it's part of that is that people understand that Spe wasting water, or we call it watering their cars, you know, <laughs> cleaning the car with uh, open hose, that's uh, not something that, uh, not efficient, and even not polite, I would say. Now, this is education, and it will take time. Another point that is uh, going to change is more sensors. I mean, the biggest issue today in the water industry is there, there are no sensors. I mean. We, ho we all know about sensors. All the sensors today that we have are either too expensive, too sophisticated, um, hard to manage, etc. And uh, once the world will, will find those sensors which are more like in the sensors we have in electricity, which a sensor can cost about half a cent, then the things will change. I mean, today in the electricity world, in the communication world, you have a lot of sensors. In the car, you have thousands of sensors. In one car, you have more sensors that, than what you have in one city in, in, Jeru in, 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 a, in the water industry. Can we expect one day to have nanotechnology? That's, uh, this is the community. Some I'm in the business side. That they will be the sensors <laughs> themselves, you know? Is that possible, you have, do you see? In the university, something like that developed? No. Sensors that are nano, uh, you know, microbiology that goes with the flow of the water and they respond in the sense. It will come. But uh, I don't see why, I mean, the, all the usage, usage of water in the city, in general, I think is negligible as compared to the use of water in uh, agriculture and industry, isn't it? Yes and no. If we're taking in consideration that uh, in the city, you use fresh water. In agriculture, you use reclamation, I mean, to treated water. Then it's two different things. So still, water in the city is something you are producing, uh, desalinated water. And agriculture actually today becomes free water, which is OK, because you actually treated water. What you save within the city 
Uh, no, no, is, I don't agree it's with not that. It's a small part? It's, mm -hmm. I don't agree. I'm, I'm looking from the dollar I'm value. I'm asking. I'm no, no, from the dollar value point of view, in the, the city, you spend a lot of dollars from the, than the dollars you spend in agriculture because it's, it's actually fresh water. So, and you don't want to, I mean, today, especially in the country we are coming from, it's all desalinated, or most of it. So we, we, we pay about uh, something like dollar and a half. The utility pays a dollar and a half for every cubic meter. That's a lot. The, the, the citizen pays about, what is it, two and a, two point, two and a half dollars almost. We, we so we pay a lot, yeah. Industry, they don't pay. Okay, but if it's free water, just treated water, why should they pay? And it's okay because then your your price for agriculture will go down. I think we we also need to keep in mind. I mean, we, we have a very uh, uh, developed world uh, um, point of view to, to <laughs> this entire discussion. There are about two and a half billion people living in the world without access to proper sanitation. Um, there are huge issues with water in developing countries that we haven't even really discussed here. And they're also part of a huge market of uh, providing these people with uh, proper um, water facilities in places where it's even difficult to put in the infrastructure to get it to them. How do you do that? How do you deal with the sanitation there? So also there you have some untapped uh, markets that will require completely yeah. maybe different yeah. solution and face different hurdles than the ones we've discussed here, which are, you know, probably from their perspective, a uh, luxury, uh, what we're talking about, uh, which is okay. You know, it's uh, each deal with, with different aspects, but there are also issues in that respect. And is it the most poor? I'm saying it's... Yeah, but most of the world doesn't spend about almost less than a quarter of what we spend here. Yeah. So the, the amount of water we are in, in this nice world spend is much more than the, the guys in the depraved world. So. I was, I was uh, very stricken by your presentation, Joel, <coughs> because you, you mentioned that 100 millimeters per liter is 10% of whatever it's in a liter, right? Of uh, antidepressants and drugs that, uh, I mean, uh, FXOR has got side effects. Uh, there's people that committed suicide on FXOR, for example. I, I heard on news, uh, Pfizer, I guess, is the whatever. <laughs> Anyways. So, so the point is that um, by pol polluting, you're potentially creating a huge problem. And in, in the case, I, I thought it was India, correct? But you need, you need to address these issues uh, from a pollut pollution point of view. And whoever the, is polluting, you need to find ways to find out, okay, this is an antidepressant, is man-made activity. You have to be able to address this issue of you know, reverse engineering the process and then dealing with the process. And uh, you know, in, in the global global level, this should be starting to be done now, not in 20 years uh, from now. And because and remember that you're talking about non-regulated compounds, that uh, the nano and the micro pollutants that no one regulated. And the main thing that I learned today, if I may say, is that it's not enough to have good scientists with uh, innovation and a product, and uh, even a startup and a company that can uh, commercialize the, the product. Uh, we need, I think, the, the wall the, the, that block all the, the, the water technology in the outside is the regulation, the decision makers. This is the block. This is the, the main thing that block us to, uh, to, uh, to become like the communication industry or others. Uh, because, you know, in mo most of the chemicals are not regulated. Most of the chemicals are not known even. Uh, exactly. But these pollutions, for example, that you mentioned, are not created by the, you know, the local agricultural activity. These are, these are pollutants that come from large multinationals, which are 100 billion, uh, billions and billions of uh, dollars that are, are being wasted, uh, sorry, sorry, created by wasting these, uh, these uh, untreated pollutants in the, in the streams. And these, these guys should be paying part of the bill. Yes, the same happen for many years ago with pesticides and herbicides. Remember, the, all the chemical industry that produce toxic pesticides, it's the same. Pesticides has the similar molecule as many of, drugs, of the drugs, and it behaves similarly in the environment. 
So you can take the pharma industry, you can take the chemical industry that produce uh, pesticides and fill our fields and groundwater and uh, surface water with pesticides. And on, I'm saying again, and their pr degradation products, most, you know, any parent compound uh, may produce between three to seven, sometimes 13 unknown pr degradation products. Some of them are not stable chemically, some of them, some of them are stable. Some of them are not toxic, some of them are more toxic than the parent compound. So we are dealing with the countless molecules that we are released to the environment from the chemical industry, from, from the pharmaceutical industry, from, you know, any house today, it's like uh, produce an industrial wastewater. Because what we have in our house, we have drugs, we have chemicals in the kitchen, we have strong oxidants and chemicals in our bedroom, in our, in our uh, we want to clean faster our uh, pants and, uh, and dishes, and we want to clean uh, our, to, to take care about our hair with a strong shampoo, <laughs> strong shampoo, <laughs> strong soap. And you know how many chemicals, <laughs> toxic Quite chemicals, aggressive. yeah, okay. we, are we are Quite releasing from, from our house every day. And, most of them are not known and, and not we're regulated. We're not paying the bill, right? We're not, we're not paying the bill. That's, that's the it's problem. Uh, that's right. It's yeah. a very interesting observation because if we think about the equivalent in the energy is radioactive. You know, no, we're all exactly. scared so much about, oh my God, some radioactive component. Active, yeah. We have no clue how radioactive, figuratively compounds. speaking, yeah, yeah. Yeah. compounds are being produced over there. Yeah, yeah. But this again deals with the other point made here about uh, the public being educated and aware because regulation, you know, what drives regulation? It's a whole different discussion, right? There are public choice theories about it, but uh, in, in part, if you put aside all the various interest groups, uh, if you talk about the dispersed people, uh, they're driven by the knowledge of something going on and the, the damage that can uh, result to them. I, I believe, Roy, that's an interesting we comment, but yeah. there's, a, there's also another side to the coin, which is, let's say you're driving your car, yeah. and if you drive fast, first, the first risk that uh, is an accident, obviously. Second one is that uh, you know, you're uh, overusing fuel, and that's, that's a direct uh, variable cost that you're paying. Yeah. And third one is the wear and tear of the vehicle. So, but all those are, uh, being, you know, being taxed as 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 we speak, on the way you drive. Yes, uh, for example, insurance insurance will also become variable depending on the how fast you drive, on the acceleration speed, etc. We we have startups dealing on that, but in the water sector, for example, if I pollute more, I have no means if I'm a utility company to charge more to yeah. X or Y people that that are either polluting more or are doing things that are not supposed to be done. And that needs to happen. The education <coughs> is one component, component but also the, 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 the fee that is levy that is supported by a certain consumer that is polluting more should be there. And you know, the, the same is in air pollution. It's course. the same because you know what we lack more <laughs> besides regulation? Environmental uh, economy. Our economy is neoclassic economy that cannot that evaluate, that cannot evaluate environmentally the, the, the in, it cannot the environment from economical, economical point, of view, point of view, the environment. The hair, the hair that we are breathing, the water that we are drinking, the land that we are uh, uh, feeding ourselves by. Yeah. So we need... I think there is more awareness to air pollution being bad and to measurement. I think I heard a lot about that. The degree what I hear today about water pollution, and especially coming from the pharma yeah. uh, industry, you know, that's something that for me is one of the most worrisome aspects. And frankly, I'm not optimistic because the pharma industry has a lot, a lot of lobby uh, behind there, tremendous, tremendous muscles behind them. Plus, they are looked as the good guys because they are saving lives. So, you know, what do you want from us, you know? People get uh, chemotherapy, you know? We want them only to save, to spend some money in order to treat exactly. their wastewater. And That's the like only great. hope, you know, for me, the only ch change, I don't know who governments will not do anything. Maybe to raise awareness, we, we just had now uh, the annual Davos, you know? Nobody talks about uh, water uh, contamination uh, in 
as far as I know. It's, it's not a big issue. But I, I think you have some, I mean, you know, you remember the Erin Brokovitz, the movie, right? It was about water contamination. You have now, for example, in California, uh, they put in very uh, much stricter regulations about uh, pollution of uh, chromium, uh, chrome-6. Yeah. And now they're doing an entire evaluation by the EPA and where there is going to go um, um, nationwide and other states will follow. So I agree with you, it's not where ideally we would like it to be. Uh, but being you know, realistic, you do see some gains, uh, um, some wins along the way. There are gonna be, of course, uh, certain setbacks, but I think there is uh, a growing uh, awareness of um, uh, contaminants by mining industry, or uh, look at the discussion around uh, fracking. Only, in, yeah, in, yeah. in the U.S., yes. so that's so, so. So the fracking maybe it comes also from from an other angles, but also part of it is the water angle of you know whether uh, fracking contaminates uh, groundwater. What does it do uh, yeah. do to uh, the uh, dwindling uh, water supply? In Israel, people set, set, people from villages stopped a big uh, project in the Golan right. Heights. The fracture uh, project that the right. government started. So, so maybe water was only part of it, yeah. but but you know, I, I think you do see uh, a growing uh, advocacy to some extent. Still, a way to go, but uh, we cannot say that you know there is nothing absolutely going on. I think we have to. Uh, but lobby, lobbying is definitely something that we need to work more on. Beyond time, and I just would like, which is good, and I'm impressed by the number of people who remained to stay here, which is by far the best I've seen for quite some time. I uh, would like to take the opportunity as a, as a kind of guest here to thank uh, the people who organized it. I think they deserve a, a, a really a show of support and, and, and thank you. Uh, Gonzalo is one, Katarina, and from Tel Aviv, Odea. And thank you so much for putting this fantastic conference really high quality together. Thank you very much. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Collar Institute of Venture at Tel Aviv University.